uh, and welcome to this virtual lecture in our, our series of lectures. My name is Sarah Pierce and I'm the chair of the Anglo-Israel Archaeological Society. And today it's our great privilege to welcome Dr. Shlomet Wexler Badola, who's going to talk to us on the subject of Herodian Jerusalem and her own excavations connected to that. But before I introduce uh, her, um, I need to just explain a few technical things, even though we know that the world of Zoom will be very familiar to, to many of you already. So um, your video screen was turned on when you arrived today in, in the Zoom meeting. If you'd like to switch it off, you are welcome to do so, but we do encourage you to let others, including the speaker, have the benefit of seeing you. It's nice to be able to speak to a, a live audience, so to speak, on, on Zoom, and it gives a more personal atmosphere to the lecture. As Sheila just said, all the microphones are switched off to reduce the background noise uh, during the lecture. So please do keep your microphone off unless uh, we ask you to turn it on at the end uh, to ask a question. Um, we will be uh, uh, allowing plenty of time for questions after the lecture. Um, and if in the course of the lecture, you're inspired to think of a question that you want to ask and put it on the record, please do put it into the chat uh, uh, in advance of the question and answer session. And at the end of the lecture, I will either present the questions direct to Shlomit, or I may ask you to ask the question yourself. Please note, as Sheila has said, that the session is being recorded and afterwards it will be available on our website, first of all to members and then to the general public. If you have missed any of our previous lectures, you will find them on the website uh, to, to access. One final point, um, the Anglo-Israel Archaeological Society is a charity and we rely on our membership fees, which are modest, and also on generous donations to continue our activities of public lectures, grants to students uh, to go on digs in Israel, and finally, uh, to publish our peer-reviewed journal Strata, which some of you may have heard uh, Rachel discussing at the beginning of this session. As a member of the Anglo-Israel Archaeological Society, you will help fund these important activities, but you will also get a copy of Strata. If you are watching, well, you are watching, of course, but if you're watching and you're not a member of our society, we do encourage you to join by getting in contact with Sheila Ford, our administrator, whose email you will already have. Um, thank you very much. That's the end of the commercial. Um, and so to Shlomit Wexler Badola, Shlomit is a specialist, a well known specialist on the archaeology of Jerusalem. And she has been directing excavations for the Israel Antiquities Authority since 1990. Her projects include important excavations at the Western Wall Plaza. In 2021, uh, she uh, produced with a co-author the Western Wall Plaza Excavations Volume 3, the Roman and Byzantine period, and also her excavations at the Western Wall Tunnels in the Old City. She's the author of many important books and articles, including the well-known volume on Ilia Capitolina, Jerusalem in the Roman period in light of the archaeological research, which was published by Brill in 2020. We're very much looking forward to your lecture, Shlomit. Over to you. Thank you. Wow. So thank you very much and thank you for the invitation. Um, so I'll try to share a screen <laughs> another time. Yeah, I think it's working now, is it? Yes, lovely. <laughs> okay, so can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Okay, great. So let's begin. And uh, I will start with a lecture and afterwards I'd be glad to answer questions or whatever. So um, my lecture's title is Herodian Jerusalem in light of new finds from the Western Wall Tunnels. And in the lecture, I will focus on findings that were discovered in recent years in excavations conducted in the Western Wall Tunnels immediately north of the Western Wall Plaza, as you can see here in the red circle, at the foot of the Herodian Temple Mount. The excavations on behalf of the Israel Antiquities Authority are initiated and funded by the Western Wall Heritage Foundation. I'd like to thank them for the help and support 
throughout the years. I've been working there since 2005, so it's many years now. I'd also like to thank the organizers of this meeting for inviting me to share the insights, which are still in the initial stage of research in this important and respected forum. In my lecture, I will try to describe the architectural remains that were unearthed so far and suggest a possible reconstruction of the development of the urban layout west of the Temple Mount in the Wilson Arch area in the late Second Temple period. I apologize in advance that I'm going to read the lecture because there are so many things to say and I don't want to forget anything, so I have written it down. But from time to time, I will also look on the eyes of through the computer. So uh, the excavation area um, extends below the street of the chain. It is marked here in red, a street that now leads from the Jaffa Gate in the west towards the main entrance gate of the Temple Mount in the east. It is called Shah Rashan Sheled, the Silsila Gate or the Chain Gate. Uh, the street is built over an ancient arched bridge known in research as the Great Causeway. You can see it in the down left. The Great Causeway, which was, was first documented in the late 19th century by Captain Charles Warren and Charles Wilson of the PEF, and has recently been partly excavated. The reconstruction that you see in the left side of the slide down is based on the finds in recent excavations. The Great Causeway stretches for about 100 meters or 330 feet. It was built according to finds in recent excavations in the Roman period and carried the southern Decomano Street of the Roman city of Elia Capitolina towards the western gate of the Temple Mount in the site of the current Babe Silsila. You can see there our reconstruction of the causeway and the Decomanos carried on top of it. However, beneath the arches of the Roman bridge, remains of a very wide wall dating from the second temple period were discovered. This 40 meters wide wall, which was also documented first by Charles Warren in the late 19th century, was probably built as a dam wall across riverbeds and at the same time also served as a bridge that carried a road. In the upper left side, you can see it in yellow below the arches, the, the brown arches, but everything will be more clear soon. In fact, throughout the periods, as far as can be suggested, this route served the main entrance axis into the Temple Mount from the west. As can be seen in these reconstructions of the Temple Mount during the Hasmonean and Herodian period, both reconstructions by Lynn Rittmeyer, the existence of a road that ascended to the Temple Mount from the west and was carried on a bridge is well accepted in, uh, is well accepted, excuse me, in the research literature. Now information is added, illuminating the history of the bridge and the road paved over it. Important information of the road and the building that stood along it is found in the ancient sources. And I'm quoting, the text of the Mishnah is related to the pre-Herodian Temenos. There were five gates to the Temple Mount, the two gates of Hulda on the south, the gate of Kiponus on the west, which was used for both entrance and exit, the gate of Tadi on the north and the eastern gate. This is from Mishnah. While Josephus describes the sacred compound before the destruction of the year 70, CE. In the western part of the court of the temple, there were four gates. The first led to the palace by a passage over the intervening ravine. The location of the great causeway, and here it is encircled once again with red. The location of the great causeway may explain some of its extraordinary features. The bridge connects the Temple Mount with the western hill of Jerusalem, the upper city of Herodian period the area of the Jewish quarter and the Armenian quarter today. It crosses the channels of two significant streams in the old city of Jerusalem, the Tiropean Valley and its tributary, the Transversal Valley. Both of them are shown here on the plan. In a plan of the Herodian city on the left side, 
the area in question is located inside the northern line of the first wall, the remains of which are known in the Jewish quarter, a few dozens of meters to the west of our area. Josephus Flavius mentions several buildings along the northern line of the first wall in this area, all public buildings. Now, that first wall began on the north at the tower called Hippicos, today in the area of the citadel near Jaffa Gate, and extended as far as the Xistos, a place so-called, and then joining to the council house, ended at the west cloister or portico of the temple in Jewish war. These buildings have been restored in plans and in the Holy Land model of Herodian Jerusalem, which is currently on display in the Israel Museum. And the left and the right side picture is taken from this model. But the remains have not yet been discovered of the Xistos, of the council house. Of... However, excavations reveal the remains of other structures which are currently being investigated. And now I shall go to the finds. So the earliest construction phase yet discovered, its estimated date is the second half of the first century BCE, is a wide wall, its width is 40 meters or 46 feet, that is extending circa 330 feet or 100 meters west of the Temple Mount. This wall is built of Roman concrete known as Opus Caimanticaeum, drainage channels and water reservoirs were incorporated in the core of the concrete wall during its construction. The core of the wall and its outer faces are built of large boulders, lightly dressed or broken building stones that were reused in the core of the wall, all casted and leveled in yellow cement. And you can see it on the left side, this yellow cement with all the small stones, the way it looks. A few years ago, these two very impressive drainage channels were discovered. They ran across the wide casted wall from north to south, one atop the other. The construction is very impressive. They are about two and a half feet wide and about six and a half feet high. The channel walls are built of dressed stones, many of of which have drafted margins along the four sides and flat bosses. The covering stones of the channels are large stone slabs. The newly discovered channels are located along the axis of the well-known municipal drainage channel in the city of David and in the Robinson Arch area, approximately 50 meters north of the latter along the same route. They seem to be a northern section of the same municipal drainage system of the second temple period, which was not known before. The explanation for this extraordinary phenomenon of two simultaneous channels, which are constructed one above the other, has not yet been clarified in this stage of study. So what is the essence of the massive yellow casted wall that was found? In the past, it has been suggested by Dan Bahat that the wall was built as a dam across the Tiropeon Valley. By others, it was suggested that it was the foundation of the Hasmonean period first wall, Charles Warren suggested it, or the foundation of the Great Causeway, Hamilton suggested it, or that it was built as a bridge to carry the low level aqueduct of the second temple period towards the Temple Mount. The findings of excavations carried by Alexander On on behalf of the Israel Antiquities Authority taught that the casted wall was built during the second temple period, that is before 70 CE. Carbon 14 dates from recent excavations by Joanna Regev and Elisabetta Boareto of the Kimmel Laboratory in the, in the Weizmann Institution allows to date its construction in the first century BCE, possibly in King Herod times. In our opinion, and as we have suggested in the past, the wall was originally built as a dam across the channels of two prominent streams, the Tiropeon and the Transversal Valley. Hence its extraordinary length and the changing directions of its axis. 
you can see in upper right that it changes its direction. It apparently carried the road that connected the Hasmonean palace and possibly also King Herod's palace, both located in the upper city with the Temple Mount. In the lower slide, you can see our reconstruction. The road apparently led to an entrance gate in the Western wall of the pre-Herodian Temple Mount, that is the Kiponos Gate. It is possible that the name of the gate, Kiponos, is a Hebrew distortion of the Greek word kapos, meaning a garden, or a word derived from it, kepaya, garden gate, kepaios, belongs to the garden, or kepeos, gardener keeper. I thank Lea de Segni for her help with the Greek. It is therefore possible to suggest that the meaning of the name Kiponos gate, mentioned in the Mishnah, is the garden gate or something similar. The excavation finds attested to several phases of construction on top of the white dam wall, which are summarized below. The first, number one, during the early first century CE, a magnificent Herodian building identified as a triclinium with a fountain was built on top of the older dam wall. I will describe the finds soon. In the second phase, or maybe contemporary, it's hard to tell, the enlargement of the Herodian Temple Mount and the simultaneous construction of the Wilson's Arch and the planning of a street with shops along the Western Wall took place. This is number two. And you can see schematically the reconstructions. In number three, construction of several arches between the Triclinium, the Herodian building and the Wilson's Arch and division of the Herodian building into three spaces with water facilities. And the last one, which takes place already in the time of Elia Capitolina after 70 CE, the first half of the second century, during the time of Elia Capitolina, the construction of a small odeon at the foot of the Temple Mount. And let me get into details. The Herodian building, which we suggested to identify as Triclinium with a fountain. Here is its plan, partly reconstructed. This is the Temple Mount, about 20 meters or 65 feet uh, to the east of the triclinium of this Herodian building. Another plan, only for you to see it without all the remains and uh, a few things. The Eastern Hall of this building was first discovered by Charles Warren in 1867 and had since, has since known, been known as the Masonic Hall, the way Charles, Will, Charles uh, Warren called it. Charles Warren entered the hall through a narrow opening high up on the north wall, where the red mark is. The hall was filled then with dirt to a great height. That is what Warren wrote. The inner stones have a smooth surface. The stones are laid in perfect alignment as if without any bonding material. And in each corner, there is a, plaster, a pilaster projecting about two inches or five centimeters from the walls. The pilasters have specifically shaped, or spatially, spatially shaped ionic capitals. And this is the drawing that uh, Charles Warren added. In the 1960s, the Masonic Hall was entered by Stein Spring an American um, archeologist, and he planned to investigate the Masonic Hall. And he wrote, uh, in respect to the Masonic Hall, first of all, we were fortunate to get into this place at all. The small space through which access was to be had and the yawning pit below seemed so difficult and dangerous that we almost despaired of entering. But thanks to the skillful Scheming of the architect Oliver M. Anwin, the courage of our chief workman, Muhammad al Khom, and the fortunate presence of a ladder of the right size among the possessions of Haj Yusuf Mugrabi, through which house, whose house we had to pass, we managed to descend into this dungeon like chamber on a number of occasions. So Stein, Stein Spring uh, did not manage to dig. The, to carry excavations in the Masonic room. And in the 1990s, Dan Bahat and Aaron Meyer 
excavated the Masonic Hall and named it the Herodian Hall. Their finds uh, showed that it was uh, of an Herodian date and they named it, since then it was known as the Herodian Hall. Israel Antiquities Authority's excavation directed by Alexander On between 2007 to 2012 and by myself um, between 2018 and 2020 made it possible to complete the plan of the building and to get to know the details of the construction better. The Western Hall of the building was revealed by Alexander On. Its walls, the same as the Eastern room walls are decorated with pilasters. A ritual bath, you can see it here on the right, was installed at the bottom of the Western Hall at the late Second Temple period. It ruined its floor and parts of the wall's decoration. There is the plan of the, of the, of the house and uh, a reconstruction we suggested uh, with uh, Professor Joseph Patrich of the Hebrew University. We work together. Um, between the two halls, the eastern one that Warren already recognized and, and Danny Bahat excavated, and the, and the western one that Alexander On uh, excavated, between the two, On revealed a fountain in which water emerges from lead pipes that have been incorporated in Corinthian capitals. The fountain hall was full of dirt when it was discovered, and this was the only way to enter it, through a very small hole near the ceiling. And you can see the men here sliding down. From the beginning, it was possible to distinguish a Corinthian capital that stood out above the surface of the dirt filling the room. Now a description of the building. In its northern part, Two, symmetrical arranged, two symmetrically arranged holes that we suggested to identify as triclinia have been preserved on both sides of the fountain. The water reservoir behind the fountain is rectangular and covered with a barrel vault. The holes and the fountain open south into a long narrow space that extended the entire length of the building. And you can see the reconstruction and the plan. On the east side of the building is an impressive double opening. There may have been another double opening which was not preserved on the western side of the building in symmetry with the eastern opening. The lower part of the wall was designed as a podium topped by a string course protruding from the wall. Above it, flat square pilasters were incorporated topped by Corinthian capitals with smooth leaves. The wall of the fountain, and here is a section that was drawn by um, Vadim of the Israel Antiquities Authority. The wall is 35 feet or 10 and a half meters long, and its height is about 23 feet, seven meters. The front of the fountain was decorated with six pilasters above the string course. You can see them in brown here the pilasters of the fountain. In the fountain, water emerged from lead pipes that have been incorporated in the center of the Corinthian capitals. And you can see the hall of the lead in these close-ups. A scan with a metal detector showed that a metal pipe installed in the thickness of the fountain's hall, wall along its entire length connected all the fountain openings, which were set at a height of about 13 feet above, above the floor level. Fountains where water flowed from openings set up in the walls are known in paintings on Greek pottery vessels of the Hydria type, which were designed to carry water. In these paintings, you can see water coming out of the mouth of animal heads fixed on the wall and young women filling the jugs directly from the stream of water flowing from the fountain. We couldn't find parallels in real, but on this Hydria in the British Museum, uh, we found them and elsewhere. In the past, we restored large water basins that collected the water of the fountain as we found no evidence of the existence of storage pool in front of the fountain. However, as the excavations continued, 
evidence of a pool partly preserved into which the water was drained was discovered. The floor of the room of the, of the, of the building is made of large smooth stone slabs that have been carefully attached. In the northern wall of the building, walls of the building above the capitals, square sockets were set to anchor the ceiling beams, indicating that the ceiling was apparently flat. It is likely that the exterior wall, which is missing today, was a wall of windows that served as the source of light and air for the building. It could protect its occupants from rain and sun and from falling down as the height difference between the floor of the building and the surface to the south of it is greater than 12 feet. The architecture of the halls, their size and grandeur, the method of the wall's decoration in parallels, similar halls of the Hellenistic and early Roman periods as the royal box in Herodium or the Pinacoteca in the Athenian Acropolis and more, allow suggesting their ident identification as triclinia or triclinium. Here, for example, at the entrance to the Acropolis of Athens, a luxurious triclinium, the Pinacotheci or, or art gallery, was described in great detail by Pausanias, the Greek traveler and geographer of the second century AD, that is famous for his description of Greece. Many paintings of familiar scenes from mythology and history were either hanged or painted on the walls. It is suggested that couches line the walls, offering a place to rest to those who came to offer sacrifices at the temples on the Acropolis or just to mingle with their friends. The splendor, architectural style, and perfection of the building with its internal fountain raised the possibility that it was constructed as a municipal building. Its proximity to the sacred precinct of the Temple Mount, about 65 feet or 20 meters west of the Western Wall, and its location along the road ascending to the Temple Mount, allow us to propose that it was intended for entertaining guests prior to their entering the sacred precinct. As the building included two dining halls of identical size and design, it was possibly intended for officials and guests of the city. As it was a dining facility, we cautiously proposed that it was kind of Pritaneon, a building in which the chairman who managed the city affairs would meet. Here they would host guests of the city council. And this suggestion was made by uh, Yossi Patrich, Professor Joseph Patrich, Alexander Owen, and myself. It was published in 2019. And now to the next thing, Wilson's Arch and the Herodian Temple Mount. No doubt that the Herodian Temple Mount is the most important structure in the area whose design has had the greatest impact on the area in question. Two archeological excavations were conducted in recent years on behalf of the Israel Antiquities Authority near the foundations of the Western Wall of the Herodian Temple Mount, shedding light on the date of its construction. One dig was conducted under Robinson's Arch in the south, here on the right side, the right red circle, and the other under Wilson's Arch, the one on the left. In both cases, it was found out that the western wall of the Herodian Temple Mount was founded on the bedrock. In Wilson's Arch, the results of the excavations were published recently in Chadashot Archeologiot, by Barak Munikendam Givon and Tehila Lieberman. The foundation course of the Western Wall was laid in a shallow, smooth foundation trench cut into the bedrock. You can see it here on the right. The fill beside the foundation course yielded meager, worn finds, including a few potsherds from the late Hellenistic and early Roman periods, first century BC to early first century CE. Similar results were obtained in the Robinson Arch area and published a few years ago by Eli Shukrun and Ronnie Reich. The findings sparked a debate on the question of when the Herodian Temple Mount was enlarged, or in other words, was it really King Herod who built the Herodian Temple Mount, or did Herod plan the, expan the expansion of the Temple Mount and the work have continued decades after his death in 4 BCE? 
The Wilson Arch, in our case, is related to the Herodian expansion of the Temple Mount. Its top level, as you can see in the reconstruction of Mir Bendov here to the left, its top carried the entrance plaza to the western entrance gate at the site of the present chain gate of Babi Silsila. The Wilson Arch, and you can see here one uh, drawing by Charles Warren and the other one a photograph taken after 1967 in the early 70s, probably. <clears throat> the Wilson Arch is an intact, impressive, huge arch that is incorporated in the Western wall of the Herodian Temple Mount to this day. The monumental arch was identified in the 19th century by Tobler, but is named after Charles Wilson, who was the first to describe it. In his words, the great arch, 42 feet span, is made up of 23 courses of stone of equal thickness, which cause an almost painful appearance of regularity. Scholars' opinions are divided as to when was the current arch built. Was it built during the second temple period? Was it built in Roman times, Byzantine times, or the early Muslim period? Most agree that even if the current arch is later than the second temple period, a similar arch was built on this site in Herodian times, similar to the Robinson Arch in the south. In recent excavations conducted at the site by Alexander Orn and later by Joe Ziel and Tehila Lieberman, it turned out that unlike the Robinson Arch in the south, the Wilson's Arch was built in several stages of construction. And here you can see um, a plan and a section of the, of the carrying wall of Wilson's Arch. A narrow arch, 23 feet or seven meters wide, was built at first, and another 23 feet wide arch was built later, north or south of the original arch. The two parts are very different from each other. You can see it in the section on the left. Uh, they are built very different from each other, and scholars' opinions are divided over the issue of the order of construction, which part was built first. However, a monumental topping arch, 46 feet wide, along the western wall, was later built above both carrying walls. This arch remains intact to this day. There are five openings in the left side, five openings in the carrying wall of Wilson's arch. They are quite similar to the four openings in the Robinson's arch that you can see in the center, which are identified as shops. It is therefore likely that originally a street was planned, as seen here, a street was planned to be paved along the foot of the Temple Mount under Wilson's Arch, a continuation of the well-known street in the Robinson's Arch area that you can see here. In the Robinson Arch area, a clear layer of destruction attributed to the year 70 CE exists. The monumental arch was destroyed and a thick layer of collapse, including stones of the dismantled arch and stones from the tops of the walls of the Temple Mount were piled up on the flagstones of the Herodian street. Above the collapse layer, the remains of Roman buildings dating to the days of Elia Capitolina were discovered. The situation discovered in the Wilson's arch area is completely different. Wilson arch, stands intact and beneath it, there is no Herodian street and no destruction layer, but the remains of a small odeon that the excavators attributed to the late Roman period. The odeon blocks down the store openings that were incorporated in the carrying walls of Wilson's arch and is therefore clearly later than the arch itself. The construction of the Odeon, however, was not completed and its remains were covered and sealed beneath a thick layer of earth that was dated by the excavators to the late Roman period, the second and the third centuries CE. Now I'm getting to the summary of all the details that I try to share with you. The remains that were discovered in the vicinity of the Wilson's Arch are related to the Temple Mount and to the road that led to it from the west, as well as to the public buildings erect that were erected along this road. 
in the upper part. The earliest relic discovered so far is a 46 feet wide wall casted in Roman concrete, which was probably used as a dam wall on the channel of two streams. And you can see its reconstruction uh, or its plan in the center. This method of construction, Opus Caimanticeum, has been known in Judea not before the days of King Herod, and it is likely that the dam wall in question was also built during this period. The integration of the drainage channels in the core of the dam wall implies that the construction was related to urban planning. It is therefore a public initiative designed to shape the urban landscape near the walls of the Temple Mount before the enlargement of the Herodian Temenos. In the center, the, the enlargement of the Herodian Temple Mount is attributed in research to King Herod. It is common to assume that King Herod laid the foundations for the enlargement of the sacred pressing, but construction continued for decades after his death at 4 BCE. The findings that have now been discovered help to specify the possible time ranges. The foundations of the Western Wall clearly cut and actually truncate the dumb wall. The top of the dumb wall was lowered and leveled and new structures were founded on top of it, the Wilson's Arch and the Herodian Triclinium. Although we cannot determine with certainty the exact date of construction or the chronological order of their construction, they both seem to date within the first third of the first century CE. Uh, it therefore seems that, um, just excuse me for one minute, please. I apologize. Once you read something, you cannot speak without reading it. So it is therefore clear, I will just maybe repeat the, the, the last uh, sentence. So um, it is therefore clear, if both of them are dated within the first third of the first century, it is therefore clear that this area located in the heart of the Herodian city between the Temple Mount and the Hasmonean Palace enjoyed an urban flourishing during the first century BCE and the first century CE. The rich construction activity that was taken, that has taken place in the area indicates public involvement and public funding apparently by the local government and possibly with the involvement of the king or the Roman ruler. The interest of the local government in the area west of the Temple Mount continued even after the destruction of 70 CE. And now I get to the lower register down. The Romans recognized the importance of the Temple Mount and preserved the main access road to it from the west. The construction of the small Roman Odeon near the Temple Mount wall, at the presumed site of the city historical council house, Buleterion, as described by Flavius Josephus, reflects in this respect the civil nature of the area west of the Temple Mount as preserved throughout the periods. And of course, the road, the Decomanos, that leads directly to the Temple Mount. So this is it. Thank you from Jerusalem. And I think we are for the questions. Thank you. Um, we already yeah. have some questions for you. Um, what is casted wall? I'm not familiar with this term. What is it in Hebrew? Yeah, it's a good question. I really, we have problems in defining this wall. This is why I was trying to, um, to, to describe the way it was built. It is built with boulders and everything is 
a hardened with a, with a very, very hard cement. And we have also negatives maybe of wooden frames that uh, the, the, the cement was casted into. So in Hebrew, I would say beton romi or opus caimanticeum, which is uh, not Hebrew, but this is the, the, uh, the name we use for the, uh, for the method. Uh, we don't know so many examples. The, in Caesarea, the port was built in, in, in cement, in Roman cement. We do not know it before the King Herod's construction uh, projects. Uh, so, but we are still uh, working on the definition of this. Uh, of this uh, so I was suggested to call it casted wall or kir uh, beton. Um, that's what I use. Thank you. Um, then we have a question from Edith Goldman. Is there any evidence of iron or LB occupation? Iron age uh, or LB, not here. No. Uh, not, in the, not in the Western Wall tunnels. In the Western Wall tunnels, the earliest thing that was found is this yellow wide or yellow cemented or casted or uh, that's the earliest thing. Uh, it probably raised anything that was underneath it. And in very, very, actually, Warren reached bedrock. We haven't reached bedrock. Mm. Only Barak Munikendam now give on and Tehila Lieberman near the Western Wall under Wilson's Arch reached bedrock. Uh, so if there are remains there, we do not know. But about 100 meters, uh, west of the of the western wall of the temple mount in the in the within the western wall plaza in excavations that um we were excavating uh, over there and i was not speaking about them today the remains of of the eastern cardo of elia capitolina were found 50 meters long but below them remains of an iron age building uh, of the seventh century BCE, very well preserved. Its walls are standing to five meters high. Uh, were preserved under the the pavement of the Cardo. So there is Iron Age in this area, but in the excavations within the the tunnels, only potsherds of the Iron Age were found. LB. I don't know of any LB or middle bronze or late bronze or anything earlier. Only the late Iron Age, 8th to 6th century BCE potsherds that I know of. Meanwhile, it doesn't say anything, but for the time. Thank you very much. Then we have two questions from David Jacobson. Um, first, where was the termination of the first wall at its northwestern end? From Josephus, it appears to have terminated at the western wall of the Temple Mount, what light can you shed on this matter? The first wall. I wish I could answer that. What we suggested, um, I'm not sharing the, the PowerPoint anymore. Uh, we, we continued, well, what our idea or the way we understood the findings was were that uh, the this what I named casted wall or opus caimanticeum, wide wall, uh, reached the, the, the pre-Herodian, I would say, Temple Mount. And we, if we continued the, the line the, in the same axis, so we reached an area that is about in the area of Warren's Gate, but 40 meters inside the Temenos. So uh, it's hard to tell, but it's, so I, I would say uh, the first wall, uh, I do not know exactly. I, I, what I was describing now was not the first wall, but the road that led to the pre-Herodian Temple Mount and the gate, the Kiponos Gate. Regarding the first wall, 
I personally suggested something a few years ago. I don't know if uh, Dave Jacobson read it, but I actually repeated what was suggested in the past because when they um, revealed the remains of the first wall in the Jewish quarter and saw this loop that it's doing and, and guiding uh, to the Northeast, uh, one of the suggestions that, uh, Maza that uh, Avigad quoted, maybe it was even Kathleen Kenyon's uh, originally, was that maybe the wall was going further to the north and not necessarily straight in a straight line. But these are suggestions. I, I cannot say anything about it because there are no remains of the first wall, to the best of my knowledge, near the Temple Mount today. I do not think that this a wide wall, wide casted wall, was the foundation of the first wall. I do not think so. We have not found any stones uh, that are typical of the first wall, and its date um, is not Hasmonean. We have nothing Hasmonean there. Yeah, I just also, uh, our... one comment there. I mean, from the siege of Jerusalem, it does suggest there was a barrier from the north during that siege. Now, whether it was a permanent wall or whether it was a siege, a counter siege wall that was thrown up, which the rebels did do, we know that. I don't know, but the impression I get is that before Herod built the second wall, there must have been some sort of defense uh, for the city on the Western Hill. And it must have gone all the way across the valley because otherwise that would have been an easy access for encroachment into Jerusalem for an enemy. Let, let me just, I want to, to that I understand you. So, so you suggest it might be that this very wide wall, dam wall was also used as a protection? Maybe the, yeah, maybe the northern edge of it. I don't know. I'm mm -hmm. coming to you to ask you because oh. <laughs> I haven't seen any abutment on the Western Wall revealed. Maybe it's there somewhere, but I haven't seen it. Maybe you know something I don't know. Oh. Um, not that I know, but this uh, this is an idea that could be that. I mean, I I personally think that it was built during the time of King Herod. I do not think, but but who knows, you know, it's, it's uh, we're working now on carbon 14 dates of the wall and uh, we have different um, suggestions. So everything is open as always in archeology. span But uh, it's interesting that we had nothing of the Hasmonean period hmm. in the excavations. Uh, so, it's, it's... Well, the Hasmonean wall would have been further to the east anyway of the Temple Mount, probably. Further to the east. So oh, any abutment yes. there, we won't know because it's buried inside the Temple Mount. Yeah, that's correct. Shlomit, can I take you to the next question, please? Yes. Um, the use of the causeway in the later Roman period for a grand approach to the Temple Mount suggests that the Temple Mount was not in disuse at that time. What do you think? This is exactly what I think. I suggested in the in the in the past that during the period of Elia Capitolina, uh, the Temple Mount, possibly the the Capitoleum was on top of it, as Locasius mm. says. So um, in my opinion, the, 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 uh, during the period of Elia Capitolina, the Temple Mount was integrated into the city and the axes of the main roads knew it and were constructed in parallel uh, lines uh, to the Temple Mount. The city may have been ruined, but when Elia, the, the Herodian city may have been ruined to dust, but not everything. And of course, the Herodian Temenos was still standing when the Romans decided to build a new city. Uh, the um, Great Causeway 
which I haven't, you know, because the title was the Herodian Jerusalem, so I didn't get into, into, into its details, but just very, very shortly to say, uh, is constructed of two rows of arches, the Northern row and a Southern row that abutted it. Mm. And um, Charles uh, Warren already described it and uh, everyone thought, suggested different what was built first uh, of the two rows of arches that are abutting each other. What we renewed, I think, Alexander On and myself in the description because Alexander was working in more than 20 different places within the arches of the Great Causeway, the Northern line of arches and the Southern line of arches and in the um, south of it in the, in the secret passage as, as it is called. And, and we collected all the data from all the excavations and what we suggested was that the northern row of arches was built first and the second row and the southern row of arches was abutting it slightly later, but both of them fall within the second century and the time of Elia Capitolina. And both of them are abutting Wilson's arch that was constructed in the second temple period and was not ruined because the Romans wanted to use them. So they did not destroy it as they ruined the Robinson's arch, but kept it and built the uh, Great Causeway or Giant Viaduct as named also in two phases. And I don't want to get into the details why two phases and exactly how we dated them, but both of them around the Hadrianic period, I would say, um, in order eventually after the southern row of arches was built also to carry the Decumanus or a street of Elia Capitolina into the Temple Mount. So evidently I think that there was something very important standing on top of the Temple Mount. Yeah. And maybe even before that, it was important for them to control, to have control over it. Thank you very Thank much. You. Um, so back to the Herodian times um, from Daniel Smith. What is the step pool that is located on the western side of the Herodian Hall building? Was that built over and thus earlier than the Herodian Hall? Excuse me, can you repeat? I, I, yeah, a difficult one. The, what the, well, no, no, the, the, the stepped pool, the one that I showed now or something else? The one that I showed the, is Daniel the Smith. Can Daniel, yeah, I, can I, I you see, speak see. yourself? No, I can. I can see him. Uh, oh right, I can't. <laughs> yeah. So, and and you, maybe you mentioned it, but maybe I just missed it. But there's the stepped pool that's on the other side where the triclinium is. Was that then covered over by the other triclinium? So we have the one side that's well preserved, and then the other side of the triclinium that mirrors it. Um, there's a pool, if I yes. understand it correctly, that's right there. Yes, yes, yes. I assume that was covered over then by the... No, no, no. no. The, the way we understood it was that this um, stepped pool that actually only half of the room, the room is seven meters uh, or 20 something feet, 23 feet wide. It's, it's, a, very, it's a very wide uh, wall. And the stepped pool that we identified as a ritual bath is actually preserved all across the room. It's a, it's a really big one, uh, but only half of it was excavated. The other half, we saw parts of the, of the steps so we could reconstruct it only. But the construction of this stepped pool or ritual bath into the Western triclinium of the Herodian structure ruined its floor and ruin the decoration of the walls. So evidently it is later. Oh. And we, uh, we dated it to the very late uh, period of the second temple period, maybe even during the big revolt or slightly earlier because we had a coin of the year 54 or 58, I don't remember now, uh, within the plaster. Of the of the ritual bath, so we we know that this is the latest phase 
And then during this phase, the fountain was not in use anymore. And the building was divided by three vaults into three different rooms or three separated rooms. And within each of the rooms, uh, water installations were, were installed. So I, I did not get into all the differences uh, that happened because there are so many details. But what we saw is that construction never stopped. What we actually thought was that due to the enlargement of the Herodian Temple Mount and the construction of Wilson's Arch, everything there changed. And the Herodian Triclinium was not used in this magnificent uh, way anymore, but it was for some kind of reason uh, changed into three smaller uh, rooms with water reservoirs and installations inside. But we, it's very difficult to date them specifically. The insertion of the ritual bath or step pool is 58 CE or later. So it's really during the late, late second temple period. Very helpful. Thank you. Um, so a question from Niels Nielsen. Uh, you mentioned a local government being involved in building the wall. What is known about the institutions of government in Jerusalem at this time, apart from the Herodian kings and the Roman civil authorities? We don't know so too, uh, too much, but if Josephus reminds the council room, the bulletarium, uh, the council house. So we know Jerusalem had a council. Maybe maybe it's a, it's a better question to, to, to ask the historians among us. I, I don't want to, <laughs> but uh, uh, we assume that in Jerusalem there was a council of the city. And uh, because there are two triclinia, or two triclinium, I think two triclinia is a better way to say. So it couldn't belong to the king. Because when we saw the, the, the really the, the, the building, the building is, I think we can say, is the nicest building in Jerusalem of the Herodian period. It's really, it, it, is, it is also preserved, especially the, what, what Warren named the Masonic Hall, the Eastern, and also the fountain. They're preserved, the, the walls are standing to the full height and, and the pilasters, you know, what do we know of such a, of, of, of such a decoration in Jerusalem. We know the Herodian Temple Mount. What other buildings with these pilasters uh, we know? We know in Me'arat HaMachpelah, in Hebron, the Machpelah cave and, and, and the Mamre, but, but in Jerusalem, and usually they are attributed to King Herod. Now we had a coin below the floors of the Triclinium. In, in my excavations, I continued uh, because the, the, the Western Wall Foundation for the Heritage of the Western Wall, they wanted to make a way for visitors to visit through the triclinium to, 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 to get into it. And we had to, to continue the excavation. So I carried the excavations there between two, 2018 and 2020. And we had to dismantle the walls, the later walls that were built on top of the of the pavement of the Herodian building, and to uh, lift the, the 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 pavement and continue to excavate below the pavement. That's the way we found about the two drainage channels that are four meters or more than twelve feet below the floors. But there was also a coin below the floor, and until then. We thought the building was King Herod, mm -hmm. but the coin, shall I say, unfortunately, I don't know, but you know, the coin is um, between 15 and 26 CE. So clearly it's the first third of the first century CE. So in the primary uh, preliminary publication in Hadashot Archeologiot and elsewhere, I quote, <laughs> the information from Donald Zviariel who read the, the coin and identified it. And uh, so the, the, the building was built in the first third of the, of the, of the first century, but uh, um, still later, 
maybe very soon after there was the construction of the enlargement of the Temple Mount, the construction of Wilson's Arch, and everything there changed. I don't know already if I'm answering the question. I... It seems very comprehensive. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, it is. <laughs> yes. Um, are you happy to take a few more questions, Romit? Yes, yes, you're, yes. You're being worked if, if hard. The people, if the people are still here, you know, yes. I must just quote a very, a very a good friend of mine, a very good colleague, Hillel Geva. Some of you might know him. He told me, Shlomit, every time I get into the Western Wall Tunnels, I get all mixed up. And every time I think I understand, but when I go back home, I don't understand anything. <laughs> so don't even think that the people who are, saying, you know, yes. who are going to hear you will understand. So I apologize in advance, you know, we're trying, but it, it's really, it's really, there are so many, it's like, especially in the first century CE, I think, it's like every ruler, everyone just came and turned out, you know, in Israel today, it's the Ministry of Education. Every <laughs> minister who comes, takes away all the plans of its formers and makes up a new plan. Mm. So the same thing in the, in the Western world plan. You know, everyone came and just, you know, just put new things in. So, so the impression is that it was really a very, very active area. And every few years, things were added. So a few more questions, please. Thank you. So Nicholas Brett's question, how much Pozzolana is in the Opus Cementicium, and is it possible the mine source of the There is no pipes? Pozzolana. No, no Pozzolana at all. And this is why it's difficult on one hand to call it Opus Cementicium, because we have no volcanic material. The Pozzolana is volcanic material, and in Rome or in Europe or in other places in the Western, also in Caesarea, they brought the volcanic material that is called Pozzulana and uh, used it in order to make the mixture and uh, strengthen everything. But uh, it was said, not by me, but by experts, that in different parts of the world, they used local materials. So uh, we checked what was uh, Meidad Cho, is a PhD student and archaeologist in the uh, author Israeli Authority of Antiquities. He, he checked the, the um, cement and said that this was a local things of, of limestone or things they powdered. And, uh, but as we read that, or he told me, and we, we have it in the books, that in different areas, they used local materials, we more uh, called it opus caimanticeum or casted wall because we saw that we have the negatives of like wooden frames where the stones were put in courses and then everything was cemented together and some something that hardened very, very, very much. It was impossible to, to dig it with, with hands. Uh, it really is very, very hard and they leveled everything and then put another layer and another layer. And also we found out that the 14 meters wide wall was actually built in two segments of seven meters each, because we have a very clear seam in the center. So all this relating to the technic uh, way of building it, uh, but it's, it's, we really have no parallels yet. Amazing, so, thank you. Um, then another question from Daniel Smith. Are there any recent publications in English that share the latest images you showed? He is currently working on a 3D creation of this area and would be interested in using these as references. Uh, not everything was published yet. As maybe I, I have to ask you kindly not, not to use it, you know, in a, but things that have been published, um, if you can uh, maybe write, many things have been published with many illustrations. Uh, you can uh, look, it's, you know, some of them I wrote here, but, uh, but I can send, send a list of, uh, you know, just references in, uh, in Chadashot Archeologiot, in Tel Aviv, in, in, in IJ, in, 
Atikot, some, some journals. Uh, so many of the things that I showed were, uh, if, if you want to do 3D reconstructions, I'll be happy to cooperate. <laughs> Um, thank you. That that sounds great. Yeah. Hmm. Um, thank you. Stephen Brody asks, is there one or two major finds that you would most love to see happen in the years ahead that would help answer a major question about the Temple Mount area? Inscription. <laughs> <laughs> I must quote also my teacher, Professor Yoram Tzafrir, Zichrono Livracha who was my teacher. He came to visit me when we were excavating the Eastern Cardo. And you know, I don't know if you know, but in Jerusalem, the Eastern Cardo, um, there was a debate whether the Southern part of the Cardo was Roman or Byzantine, because the Western Cardo, when it was excavated by Professor Avigad, the results showed that it was paved only in the sixth century in the Justinianic age. There were coins of the sixth century below the pavement. So it's Byzantine period. And when I started excavating, all my colleagues came to me and say, Shlomit, find the Eastern Cardo and let us know the exact date. So we found several things and eventually we suggested it was Hadrianic. But when Yoram Tzafrir, Professor Tzafrir came to visit me, he said, Shlomit, what about an inscription saying once and for all, you know, so the same about, you know, we are very, very poor with inscriptions in Jerusalem. So if I would really hope for something that would stand on two good legs on the <laughs> ground, I would say they, that. But meanwhile, I'm, you know, coins, everything that has a, a specific date would be very, very good. Yeah. Although Wonderful. we are very bet we are much better with pottery reading today also because let's say in Elia Capitolina, Teila Lieberman, and Rachel Barnatan uh, were working a lot on the pottery. Renate Rosenthal Hagenbottom that worked on the pottery from our excavation in the Eastern Cardo, they really uh, know today to date much better the second and third, the third and fourth, the fourth and fifth centuries in Jerusalem uh, and, and differentiate between them. Until 20 or 30 years ago, we used to say Roman Byzantine between the second and the sixth centuries. Now we, we, we really learned how to date these centuries. So I'm optimistic. And one final question um, from Nachshon Gal. Do we see those two rows of arches in the synagogue that is immediately north of the Western Wall Plaza? No, 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 no. Uh, you're speaking about Ohel Itzchak, I think, which is uh, north of the Western Wall Plaza. Uh, not there because this is to the north of the giant viaduct. In order to see these two rows, it's very, very simple. Everyone who walks in Jerusalem and enters from the Western Wall Plaza into the, what is called the Western Wall Tunnels or the secret passage that uh, takes all the visitors through. So immediately north of the secret passage, which is a very narrow vaulted corridor you are walking through, to the north, there are openings into the uh, rooms actually, or arches of the giant viaduct of the Great Causeway. And once you enter into any of them that is open occasionally now, um, at least few of them that were excavated by Alexander on, are now open to the public. When you are just standing inside and look on the ceiling, you can see very clear the seam between the Northern Arch and the Southern Arch. All the Northern Arches make up the Northern Row of Arches, the Northern Bridge as we named it, and all the southern one make up the southern bridge. And both of them are abutting each other. And in one room, room number six, when you count them, when you look up, you can see the flagstones of the Decomanos lying on top of both rows, the southern and the northern rows of arches. And that's the way we proved that actually the Decumanus was laid only after the construction of the southern row of arches. 
So prior to that, there was only the northern row of arches, narrow bridge. Only after it was enlarged with another row of arches, these flagstones were laid on top of it, and we can see them because both rows of arches are abutting each other, but due to earthquakes or whatever, they moved a little bit and the gap was open between them. So we could still see the flagstones on top of both. Shlomit, thank you so much. You've been very generous in answering so many questions. I just want to conclude by with a few remarks that First of all, when this society was founded in the 1960s, one of its main purposes was to invite world leading experts and archaeologists working in Israel to share the new discoveries and excitement of the new archaeology in Israel in the 1960s. And it's so wonderful to have a world leading expert today sharing these really exciting discoveries that she's made in Jerusalem uh, and continues to make. So it's a huge privilege for us to hear from you. Thank you. And you've managed to combine beautiful clarity uh, with also persuading anyone who wasn't aware of it, uh, and I'm sure many of us like me weren't quite aware of, of how complex the whole issue is of the archaeology in the area that you're working in, and what a, an absolute minefield of questions it, it poses. Um, so huge thanks to you. I hope you'll come back to us in the future and tell us more about what you discover next and really hope you find an inscription. So thank you so much. Thank really you. great to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. for your patience. Thank you. Okay. So I think we must let you go now. Uh, and thank you to everyone for attending. Thank you, Sheila, for organising. Thank you, Rachel, for being there to help with, with, with the IT. Um, and uh, we look forward to seeing you at the next uh, lecture in June, or details of which are on our website. Thank you. Bye Thank for you now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.